and Julian and I talk about this in the book, that the greeting is a great symbol of what kind of relationship you're creating. Communication is not just about transferring information from one place to another. It's about creating a relationship. So the way you establish a connection and greet people is the first sign of the quality of relationship you want to create with others. This is the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast, brought to you by Nestle and Associates, a Newport Beach, California-based ERP organizational change management firm serving the private equity industry. The ERP OCJ seeks to share expertise, insight, experience, and research, and to create effective conversation to help guide ERP organizational change to real, measurable, and verified success. And now, here's your ERP expert and host, the founder of Nestle & Associates, Dr. Jack Nestle. Hey everyone, Jack here. In this episode, we will discuss positive communication for leaders, which happens to be the title of our guest's new book. We will explore how to lead effectively, create community, and inspire positive change. We will also discuss the importance of courageous organizational communication for creating high-performance workplaces. Let's examine the benefits of positive communication for leaders and courageous communications for employees, leaders, and organizations. Our goal is to provide valuable insights and practical tips for private equity firms and all stakeholders involved in ERP organizational change. So today we will discuss communication strategies for effective ERP organizational change with guest Alex Lyon. We share key ideas from experience and from his new book, Positive Communication for Leaders. His co-author is Julian Mirabel. Alex is a leading expert in workplace communication with over 20 years of experience in coaching, speaking, and conducting workshops for companies such as Nike, Google, Visa, and McKinsey. He is a communication professor at the State University of New York, Brockport, and he is the author of the book, Case Studies and Courageous Organizational Communications, Research and Practice for Effective Workplaces. He has also published numerous articles on workplace communication, and he has a popular YouTube channel with over 440,000 subscribers. Please welcome our guest, who will share insights and strategies for creating a culture of courageous communication and effective leadership communication in the workplace. From Rochester, New York, Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, Jack. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You bet. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I'm a huge fan of your work and your new book, especially, which I can't wait to get into and, and share some of that with our listeners. Uh, but Alex, before we get started, can you tell our listeners more about yourself? Sure. I'm essentially an academic at heart. I've been teaching college at the graduate and undergraduate level for over 20 years. And back in the day when I was in grad school, I started consulting with a firm in Los Angeles part-time and I've been doing that ever since as well, doing professional speaking, coaching, consulting. And as you mentioned, I'm a, a YouTuber, a YouTube creator, <laughs> I guess they call it now. So yeah. I'm having a ton of fun doing that. I've been doing that for about seven years. And it's just a great way to get the message outside yeah. of the classroom and into the eyes and ears of people all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. And highly recommended. And we will definitely include a link to your YouTube channel in our show notes uh, for sure. Well, Alex, uh, thank you. I'm so excited to have you on today. And I, I know your expertise in, in organizational communications and leadership will provide our listeners with great insight. So I, I'm really looking forward to it. Listeners, all of us here at the ERP OCJ hope you find this podcast useful as we share lessons learned, discover best practices, and explore the human element components of ERP organizational change. Please stay with us till the end. Alex will give us his actionable golden nugget of advice based on today's conversation. Our conversations here on the ERP OCJ are built around the listen and learn approach. It's when you apply what you've learned that you begin to move the needle forward. So let's dive in. So Alex, um, I would like to touch on some ideas in your first book, uh, if you don't mind. And that was a courageous organizational communication case studies. And we'll share a link to that as well. Uh, and then I'd like to dive into some questions around your new book that was just released, which I think is, is just fantastic. And that's Positive Communication for Leaders, Proven Strategies for Inspiring Unity and Effecting Change. So Alex, if I may, I, I want to share with our listeners some of your insight around the importance of courageous communication. So can you tell us more about your communication-based model of courage and what that's all about? Yeah, it really is a communication-based model of courage. So we're all familiar with the basic idea of courage. Sometimes there's 
something difficult you have to do. It's challenging. You have to go against the grain for whatever reason. And you've got to muster up some courage to take action. So the same principles apply to communication. In the workplace, there are norms and even what you might call, quote, best practices that sometimes in the end, we find out they're not all that good for the organization's long-term health and effectiveness. And so courageous communication is setting up four key communication practices that help people speak up against sometimes the norms that are there and the tradition that's there and the cultures that's there and to help the organization turn a corner and become more effective. So it takes courage to speak up and to go mm-hmm. against things. No one likes to be that, you know, this is the old expression, the nail that sticks up is the one that gets pounded down. So <laughs> the, these are the kinds of practices that will ultimately make things better for everybody, but they're a little challenging to do. Yeah. And Alex, can you share how can leaders encourage and model courageous communication in their teams? Uh, can you just provide some general practical tips uh, to our listeners on that point? Yeah, we could go into a lot yeah. of it. I, I guess I can give you the four key behaviors sure. that yeah. we break down, then we can go from there. Sure. The first tension is between the tendency for leaders to have controlling communication versus collaborative communication. So the case studies are both cautionary tales and success stories about organizations who struggled with control because uh, that often can squelch innovation and make it very difficult for anything to get done when when systems are so controlling that their people can't thrive. That's not good. So I advocate moving toward a more collaborative approach to generate new ideas, to innovate, to move more quickly. So that's the first communication behavior. The second one is balancing all of that top-down communication with bottom-up communication. There's plenty of top-down communication. We get inundated with emails, with notifications, with reminders, with meetings, and we need all that, I understand. But there are very few systems typically in organizations to solicit and move communication up the chain of command. I'm thinking about the two NASA shuttle explosions, like the people at the bottom totally understood the difficulties, the problems, and they couldn't get anyone to listen. They had no channel of communication to pass their important information upward. So balancing that top down with upward. The third behavior is being transparent rather than secretive. Many organizations are obsessed with secrecy to the point where even people within their organization aren't allowed to talk about really important issues, especially the issues that could hurt the organization. So I'm advocating for more transparent communication about the issues that matter most. And one of the key signals is the stuff that people are afraid to talk about, don't want to talk about. Those are usually the exact things they should be talking about because those are the ones that can take down a whole company. And then the fourth behavior is a tension between being more engaging versus the tendency for the communication in most organizations to be impersonal. Everything's automated. We're always talking to chatbots and robots, but how can we communicate and connect more on a personal and engaging interpersonal level so that we connect as real whole human beings rather than just a person in a role communicating with another person in the role? And that's the end of it. So those are the four key behaviors that take some courage. Great. Well, thank you. Alex, what would you say in your experience, what are some of the biggest challenges and barriers that organizations face in promoting open and honest communication and trying to implement those behaviors? There are numerous uh, obstacles to that. One of them is the experience where you you try to say something new and you get hit back with some version of, well, that's not the way we do things around here. Or we tried that once and it didn't work. You know, there's that culture that has a momentum and saying something fresh in that conversational stream is really difficult. And then the other obstacle, of course, is just anytime, anytime you suggest change or something new, it takes a little while for people to get used to it. So there's, and and that's even on our best days, right? We have to really think about what we want. So open communication, people get challenged. Oh, we're out of our comfort zone. We've never done that before. And that's just at a personal level. And so a lot of it is, I have found a lot of it is that it's really not about the organization itself. It's usually about the people. So let's say someone has a control issue. They're a very micromanaging manager. Chances are that person is a micromanager uh, in their personal life too, as part of their personality. But then they bring that to work and they act as if it's a function of their role. 
It's almost yeah. like they use the organization's goal to, to justify mm-hmm. micromanaging when really it's just them. It's just them as a person. So that's another obstacle, the personal side of it, which we sometimes confuse with an organizational priority. Well, thanks, Alex. So you just shared with our listeners this idea of communication-based model of courage. You then shared some behaviors on modeling that courage. And then you also shared some of the biggest challenges and barriers. What would you say, uh, I guess, lastly, on this topic of, of courageous communication, what would you say is how can individuals, you know, how, how can Jack Nessel in a workplace approach difficult conversations or conflicts with courage and empathy? I mean, do you have any... Uh, tips and pointers for our listeners as far as individually what you can do to take responsibility and ownership and and help create that positive culture of courageous communication. Yeah, there the four behaviors I think anybody can do, more collaborative, mm-hmm. be more you could solicit upward communication or make a way to pass it up, you can be more transparent and you can be more engaging. That can start at the one-on-one level. And indeed, I think that's the best place to start. Start within your department start within your one-on-one conversations. It's really difficult to institute these organization-wide, system-wide, but you can start on your own team and make it normal, make it natural to have, for example, transparent conversations about difficult issues. Start sharing some of the difficult issues and and don't make it seem like you're breaking some taboo. Just have the conversation like, hey, the couple of things we need to address and talk about them more openly, see how it goes. Talk about some other things more openly, see how it goes, and then people will become accustomed to doing it. It's got to start somewhere, though. There's the old, you know, you can you can wait and try to convince everybody, the, the top-down hierarchy to say, well, this is a whole new thing. But really, you can do these four behaviors in the midst of even the strictest bureaucracy. Yeah, great insight. Uh, that's what I was hoping you would say, because I think, Alex, um, it all starts with, as you said, it starts one-on-one, right? And so I think if you were to write and reflect upon those four behaviors and, and be intentional and deliberate and then get feedback, you know, so maybe you find some internal mentors or, you know, internal colleagues and, and you just share, as you'd mentioned, you share those behaviors and you just have those conversations, you know, so maybe, maybe that's how it starts internally. And as you said, uh, it could be hard to implement organizational wide but again, it starts at that individual level, right? And I think that, you know, kind of that, that grassroots level, I guess I would say, where you start with the individual and as individuals within an organization, you have responsibility, you know, you, you have ownership and commitment to improving your workplace and creating that culture of, of courageous communication. And so you can do something about it. Right. And mm-hmm. I think that, yeah, it's, it starts one on one. And that is through writing and maybe starting with your four behaviors uh, that you just shared with our listeners, reflecting upon those and then maybe think about how you can get feedback and how you are performing against those behaviors. Mm-hmm. Is that something that uh, makes sense for our listeners? Yeah, that's a, you said it better than I could start where you are, start within your own sphere of influence Put these into practice, get better at them, see how it goes, and try to spread it from there. Well, Alex, great insight there. I I appreciate you sharing that uh, with us. And so now I'd like to switch gears to your new book. Again, that is Positive Communication for Leaders, Proven Strategies for Inspiring Unity and Effecting Change. And again, as, as I had mentioned, I read your entire book and I really appreciate how you give practical yet research-based strategies for positive leadership. So Alex, if you would, please allow me to walk through the chapters. And I'd like to ask that if you could just share a little bit with our listeners and then we can leave it up to our listeners and provide them with the link to your book and they can purchase the book to learn more. But I think the best way to share your work is uh, if you could just take a minute as we walk through each one of the topics of each chapter and you know just take a moment to explain further what that topic is about and, and what it means. Um, but first, I want to share with our listeners what you wrote in the preface of your book. Uh, and again, this is with your colleague and co-author, uh, Julian Miraval. And you wrote, quote, we wrote this book to equip you and other people who are in a positions of leadership and influence to create meaningful and influential relationships with your employees and have the skills to build a positive workplace culture. 
end quote. And I think you, uh, you hit the nail on the head here um, with, uh, with your book and, and with each one of these chapters and the way you broke it down. Uh, and again, what I really appreciate is just the excellent practical uh, advice, but yet research-based strategies. Um, so um, I, I really do appreciate that, your work. So that being said, Alex, um, you're, if you want to add anything before we dive in here, uh, feel free. Um, but your chapter two is greet to create human contact. What do you mean by that, and why is that so important? Well, one of the things that we learned, and that my co-author Julian articulated in one of his earlier books, is that every culture in every part of the world has greeting rituals. They're, they look different, but they all know what a good greeting is. And when people blow it off, screw it up, it will cause a lot of difficulty in mm -hmm. the relationship. And so we said, let's start at the beginning. Let's talk about how... When you are first running into someone for the day or for the week, or if you haven't seen them in a while, how do we greet people and how do we do that in a way that creates and invites a human connection? How can we do that in a way that moves closer, moves in to the other person rather than the distant, uh, I don't know, like a football Heisman, you know, the where you stick the arm out and you say, I got to, I'm busy. I got to keep going. That creates a real bad impression. It creates a bad... And, and Julian and I talk about this in the book that you're, the greeting is a great symbol of what kind of relationship you're creating. Communication is not just about transferring information from one place to another. It's about creating a relationship. So the way you establish a connection and greet people is the first sign of the quality of relationship you want to create with others. And by the way, it's one of the first things we withdraw when you're having conflict with yeah, people in yeah. the workplace or at home. It's right. one of the first things you avoid. You don't want to greet them. You'll walk the other way in the building. You'll figure out a way to swerve around them so you don't have to because greet and connect because we realize the significance of it. So that's why it's so important to get that first step right. Greet them. How you doing? How's everything going? How was your weekend? Make some small talk. Open a channel of communication and that leads to lots of other work and task related goals yeah. that you can move to from there. What uh, powerful uh, advice there. And Alex, let me ask you this. I've actually often wondered about this and observed it. So I assume that the create and invite human connection includes email. Yeah. You know, so it's just interesting to me and, and obviously you as well, just studying leadership in general and in the broad sense, right? And one of the things, you know, you see, especially at Nestle and Associates and working with lots of executives and CEOs and so forth. You know, you get an email and it's just one or two sentences, no hi, no thank you, no please, no, <laughs> no none of that, right? But yep. doesn't, uh, especially internally amongst your, your internal stakeholders, does that apply? I mean, is that a tip and a pointer? So it's not just in person, face to face, but it seems that that is a valuable idea and notion through other forms of communication as well, especially email. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's one on one. It's in group meetings, and it's absolutely in emails. In fact, we yeah. cited some research from the research team, the New Zealand Language Study, Language at Work Study, I believe it's called, and they did a, an audit of emails, and they found that cultures, workplace cultures that had difficult, toxic atmospheres, had no greetings and no sincere closings in their emails. They just said the meeting is at five o'clock. But Is the organi right? yeah, but the yeah. organizations that had great cultures, some of the best places to work, when they examined their emails, they would say, I hope everybody had a good weekend. I'm so excited to get back to work. By the way, our meeting today is at five. Hmm. Warmest regards, Alex Lyon. And yeah. the question is, you know, are, is the culture creating these warm greetings or are the warm greetings helping to create the culture? And it's a little bit of both, but one thing is for certain, you have to, if you're already in a toxic culture, you have to break the cycle. You have yeah. to try. And yeah. this is a great intervention, a great inroad to change things, to begin to turn the corner and connect. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. I'm going to have to, because it is a topic I've often wondered about, but really never dug into. Uh, I'm going to have to grab that paper and uh, share that out as well on, in our show notes. It sounds like a fascinating piece of research. Yeah, we do cite it in the book to make it easier on you. Good. Perfect. So Alex, uh, tell me more about your third chapter, Ask to Discover the Unknown. I mean, when it comes to positive communication, why does that matter? Well, it's especially important for leaders. When we ask questions, especially questions of our peers and our followers, we are getting to know them. We're discovering things that we would not have known about them otherwise. And 
if you just think at an interpersonal level, now you're a, a podcaster, so you understand the value of asking questions, but you know, most people in everyday life don't even realize they're supposed to ask questions to get a conversation going. If you've ever been part of a really boring conversation at a party or something, it's usually because everybody just keeps telling long drawn out stories because they think they're there to entertain everybody. But really the best conversations come from questions, back and forth dialogue. And as a leader, you can begin asking more questions and drawing out the people around you, getting to know them. And as a leader, that helps you understand their needs more effectively. And then you can respond to those needs more effectively. And one of the research bits we cite in the book is that only 6% of all communication acts are questions, but 60% of conversation in the workplace is generated from those questions. So asking questions and better questions is literally a leadership behavior. Yeah, though so that's uh, interesting uh, statistics. All right, Alex. Well, let me ask you this one, and I think Chapter Four was was one of my favorites because I do think this is seems to me to be an underemphasized, I, I guess, tool, and that is compliment to affect people's sense of self. Mm-hmm. And that's in the workplace. People normally think of that as positive feedback, a, a compliment that is specific, usually about something that the leader watched happen or heard about through the grapevine, like, wow, I heard you did a wonderful presentation, just wanted to say thank you for your preparation. That's a compliment. And that not only reinforces the kind of positive behavior we want, but it creates, again, the relationship. It shows people that the leader cares enough to follow up. And complimenting is something that we don't do. It feels like it's a risk, you know, like, oh, I don't know, if I say they did a good job, does that somehow diminish my own stature, if I lift them up. And so in the workplace, a lot of people will hold compliments back and they won't say what's on their mind. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a bit discouraging, but leaders words carry extra weight. And when a leader pats you on the back in a sincere way, by the way, these all have to be sincere. These aren't calculated behaviors. Authentic. Yeah. Yeah. They have to be authentic. Yeah. Yeah. Because people can usually tell the difference. If when you get a sincere compliment, some sincere, genuine, specific feedback from a leader, it can really change your, your whole outlook on working there. You know, you Mm -hmm. think, wow, people are noticing what I'm doing. They're valuing me. This feels great. So it's an underused leadership behavior, but one that uh, we should all do. Most of the time, we just hear about mistakes we've made. You know, we hear the negative feedback. We don't often enough hear the compliments. Yeah, and Alex, I think your your chapter five is also another underused leadership behavior, and that is to disclose to deepen relationships. How can disclosing information and ideas deepen relationships? Disclosure is a powerful tool, but it's also the one that leaders struggle with the most because they're putting themselves out there a little bit and that feels like a risk. It feels vulnerable. But when you're disclosing, you're telling people information about yourself that they would not otherwise know. One of the powerful moments happens though when a leader shares a little bit of their background, their struggle, what they've overcome to get there or how they dealt with a similar situation in the past that you might be dealing with now. Those kinds of personalized moments of disclosure can really connect people and humanize the leader in a way that you're more relatable and people want to work even harder for you. They they think, wow, he just told me about himself. And that makes me feel like we're, we have a real relationship. It's not, we're not just in roles here. And then they're going to step up for you. They're going to feel like, oh, he knows, he understands me. She understands me. And there's that beginning of the empathy process happening. And this is, by the way, the the closest thing in my field, I've been saying lately, that this is like a magic wand. You, perhaps you've felt this, Jack. So someone tells you something about themselves and then you feel a freedom to, or even an obligation to share something similar, yeah. right? They tell you about their life, then you feel like, oh, I should tell them about my life. Yeah. That's like a magic wand, disclosure. And then the other half of the magic wand is reciprocity. Yeah. So that, that's a mutual exchange. And when we disclose in the workplace like this, it really does create a bond where you feel like you've exchanged gifts and your relationship has been solidified. Yeah, absolutely, Alex. I, I agree. And I, I think that when you disclose and you're being authentic, you know, as you'd mentioned, that just creates empathy, right? And yeah. I think empathy is an important part of any relationship. And in fact, I, there's been multiple uh, papers that have been written on leadership qualities. 
and I, I don't recall them off the top of my head, but I have several of them. And a couple of the the top two, I guess, um, uh, factors for leadership are the very topic in which you're an expert at, and that's communication. And then the other one, two-way communication, effective communication, right? Yeah. And then the other one is empathy. Out of all the potential, you know, leadership attributes and behaviors and all these other factors that create good leadership, empathy is one of them. And I think that that's just because we're all human. We meet and we collect in a certain workspace, perhaps, or within a certain, under a certain umbrella or organization. But at the end of the day, we're all human. And to, to create that valuable relationship, it means being human. So that means complimenting mm -hmm. each other and being genuine about it and just disclosing information about yourself and not thinking that makes you weaker. Because at the end of the day, those are ideas and things that, that create empathy within the relationship. And therefore, it creates additional trust, right? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Great ideas. Okay, number six, encourage to give support. So the world, as Rocky says, ain't all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> and in, in fact, positive communication is not just about having a sunny attitude or being superficially peppy. It's about striving for positive outcomes more than anything else. And part of that means encouraging people, giving them support when they're struggling. And this is something that leaders could get better at as well. Again, continuing the conversation about empathy that we're having here in the book, we say that the shortest road between a leader and a follower is empathy. It's what binds us. And one of the ways we can do this is when people are struggling, when they're in distress, when they're going through something professional that's difficult, a leader oftentimes has traveled the same road, they have been there, or they've helped other people get through it. And so it's one of those times where you can help with advice, you can help with more listening, you can help with some kind of concrete action to help them out. But it's important as a, as a positive behavior to lend that support. If this were an interpersonal relationship, we call it social support, which is a powerful yeah. thing that people need when they're in, you know, in health problems and difficulty. But as a leader, you can support them in the workplace this way as well. So it's really important when people get knocked down to help them get up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Alex, on, on your next uh, chapter here, and it's called Listen to Transcend Differences. And, uh, you know, I just kept thinking about the idea, and you, you've probably heard this before, right? That some people think to talk and some people talk to think. Right. And and right. I think that's true, right? I mean, how many times have you maybe been in a meeting or a board meeting or just in, in a, uh, you know, some sort of conference or whatever? And, and I think there's some truth to that. But, you know, at the same time, listening is an art, right? It takes practice. It takes being delivered. And especially perhaps for those folks that talk to think, but I think this idea of listening, not just talking, but listening and listening carefully and deliberately to transcend differences is a very insightful idea. Can you share more about that with our listeners? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the, one of the things that leaders know as they move up is that the higher they go in a organization, the more time they'll spend listening. When you're an individual contributor, you certainly listen a lot as well, but when you're a leader, everybody's coming to you all the time with their problems or struggles. You're attending meetings constantly. You're always listening to people. Some of the leaders are known for their public speaking, but what you don't see behind the scenes is they're listening most of the day. So it is a leadership behavior, first and foremost, that anyone has to adjust to and get ready for. And then it depends on how well you, you do it. And in the book, we talk about the basics, which is, you know, putting your phone away, uh, pushing away from your devices, really connecting, leaning into the conversation literally and metaphorically. But then it also has to do with hearing the common humanity that you share. Listening deeply means understanding that there's common ground here. And that's one of the ways you can transcend those differences is we all want mostly the same things, right? Happy, healthy, meaningful lives. And we all oftentimes struggle with many of the same things. So listening for that deeper level is really the key. So we're not really talking about comprehensive listening, like where you're trying, like learning like a student, taking good notes from a teacher's lecture. We're talking about how you listen to what's beneath the surface when you're in leadership position. And then through that commonality, again, we get back to empathy, but also it equips you. Now you, as a leader, you have better information. You understand what's going on with people. And so when you make a decision, when you have to make a judgment call, it's going to be much more likely to hit the mark. So it's about connecting. It's about building relationships. But listening is a really effective tool for leaders who want to get it right. 
Absolutely. So Alex, do you have the, for any of our listeners, you know, any, any employees in the workplace, like just a couple of good tactical items they can do to improve their listening skills? Yeah. Well, I mentioned a couple a second ago, but one of the biggest things you can do is just commit to listening and get rid of anything in your way that might stop you, like your phone, like a screen, Yeah, you know, shut the door if there's someone's uh, jackhammer out there or close the window so the lawnmower doesn't bother. And really just focus, give the person your undivided attention. They say that Elvis, when he listened to people, he made you feel like you were the only person in the universe. <laughs> I, yeah. I would have loved to experience yeah. that. But I think to myself, yeah. if, the, if the king of rock and roll can make time for people and be undistracted, that is step one. Yeah. And once you put yourself, once you position yourself to listen like that, then you half the work is done. You know, you just keep an open mind and hear what they have to say. You know, don't cut them off. Really hear them out. Don't do that thing where people listen to respond. Just listen to understand. And, and you know, that's going to get you pretty much a passing grade, if not better. Very few people even listen as well as we're describing here. You yeah. know, I would say maybe 10% listen that well. So you're, you're going to be in an elite group if you just do this, <laughs> the basics. Yep. And again, don't you agree, Alex, that like any of your advice and recommendations in each one of these chapters, it takes intent, right? It takes thought and reflection. How do I improve yeah. each of these behaviors? You know, right. you, you don't just read it in a book and think, oh, okay, well, yeah, you know, that, that makes sense. But if you truly want to make a difference, you know, you need to practice it. It's like anything. Yeah, that's right. Um, what about chapter eight, inspire unity and effect change? Well, that's where we bring it all together and we say, okay. You know, we've laid out the principles. Now let's take a long-term approach and put this into practice. And the easiest way, and we've been, you know, doing talks on this and meeting with clients. And the easiest way that they seem to appreciate is where you say, just work on one behavior per day. So let's say Monday, you just work on greeting people really well. And mm -hmm. don't worry about the rest. Just work on greeting. Tuesday, ask more questions. Even if you ask four or five better questions on Tuesday, give yourself a check mark on Wednesday, compliment, give a couple of specific pieces of feedback and you just cycle through these one per day, make it really easy. And in the, in the book, that chapter is really about creating a communication plan that does exactly this, just chart out a path to work on these and get some repetitions in so that they become, and just keep cycling through them in, until they each become second nature. And, and that's really something I appreciate about, and that's exactly precisely what you do in your book, right? Is you, you take these yeah. known research-based ideas and you make it very practical for your, your readers. Uh, so I appreciate that. Well, Alex, it's been a fun conversation. Uh, thank you for sharing some of your work with our listeners. And I do realize we just scratched the surface. And, you know, I, I do appreciate you joining us today to share some of the, the basic ideas behind each chapter. And I really do encourage our listeners to check out your book. There's so much more in each chapter. And I think Alex just kind of laid out the, some, of the, some of the basics. But uh, Alex, lastly, my one more question for you here is in terms of organizational change or, or ERP organizational change success and knowing what you know about leadership and communication, what is your golden nugget of advice for our listeners based on today's conversation? How would you distill and articulate this conversation into one last little golden nugget? I would say contrary to what a lot of people believe, I think it really all comes down to the human equation, relationships. And that we can surround ourselves with all the best systems and all the best processes. But when it all comes down to it, when we look back at our career, we're going to remember the relationships. We're going to remember the people we worked with. We're going to remember the times we shared. And so this book is really about helping to create better relationships so that we have fond memories to look back on. Great insight. Well, thank you for that, Alex. That's a, a great piece of advice and, and insight. Listeners, as we know, effective communication is crucial for creating high-performance workplaces and adopting a culture of courageous and effective communication. Effective communication can bring many benefits for employees, leaders, and organizations. 
We encourage our listeners involved in ERP organizational change to take the insights and strategies shared in this episode and in Alex's new book and apply them in their respective workplaces. Remember, it's not just about learning, but it's also about taking action and implementing what you've learned to drive the change. Alex, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, We really appreciate your dedication to your trade. We appreciate your work. Uh, We appreciate your dedication to your academic endeavors and teaching. Um, But please tell our listeners one last thing before I let you go. Tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you and how they can learn more about your new book. Well, we have a website for the book. It's called positivecommunicationforleaders.com. So you can check it out there. And also, if you happen to be on LinkedIn, that's where I enjoy connecting with people most. Super. Well, Alex, thank you again, sir. When's your next book coming out? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. That's a that's a inappropriate question, Jack. I'm still I got PTSD from writing yeah, this one. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, Alex, thank you so much, my friend, and uh, keep in touch. And looking forward to uh, uh, keeping in touch with your work and, and sharing that out with our listeners. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. Thanks for the great conversation. You bet. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the ERP OCJ podcast.